and you can be seated. Yeah, I'm glad that wasn't me. Now that we've broken the ice and you know that anything is possible, it completely relates to my message, which I just want to first thank Pastor Bianca for inviting me to be a part of the house today. Um, she is an amazing leader. She is beautiful. Guys, she is a supermodel on the outside. Like, all that hair is hers. <laughs> like, if I want hair that much, I'm going to have to clip it in, sew it in, glue it in, microbead it in, something. Uh, and then she's dope, right? Because we, it was my birthday Friday, so she took me out yesterday, and we got massaged and pampered because that's what you do when you're over 30. And um, she's like, girl, I was so sus, so I asked for the pics and the vids, and I'm like, I need receipts, okay? And I'm like, oh, can you translate for somebody a little older? than I don't know. And so I'm like, how are you a supermodel and cool and yet so beautiful and godly and strong and honest and integral on the inside? I want to let you know you have a great church. You have phenomenal leadership. And I believe that you have a future here at this church that is so bright you're going to have to wear shades. Can you just give it up for Father's House and Pastor Bianca, your leadership here? And then I do have an honest point, and I'm actually very thankful. I thought I was eating my time, and I was going to have to talk really fast, but they gave me my full 30 minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. The name of my message is, What is Faith? Right? Because we're not like Christians or Catholics or Muslims or Evangelicals or Pentecostals or Charismatic. We, we, that's not faith. That's denomination. Right? So what is faith? What is faith? How do we use it? When does it happen? Why is, why is faith? Y'all, I'm the kind of girl, I have questions, and I want the answers. And then I'm also a woman, which means I picked out two outfits, and I had two pairs of shoes for this morning. And I also had two titles. So my other title is, what is faith? And it's never for less. It's always for more. So we got two titles with today's message. And I want to jump right in after I pray real quick. Is that okay? Father God, please forgive me for all my foolishness a minute ago. And thank you for letting your house be a fun place. God, just help me to flow and do the things that you want me to do, to speak to the people that you want to speak to in codes and words that I wouldn't know to say, but you do. I ask you for none of me and all of you. Please think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Yeah, glory to God. He's good. So before we jump into our first scripture, if you've got a Bible, you can page on over to Hebrews 11.1. 1. Um, a little bit about my resume. Well, I was born in Canada and do not look like it. Um, I was adopted in the U.S. when I was three. My mom married my adopted dad uh, the day before my birthday on April 18th and when I was turning three years old. And he was a factory worker, man, from a little town. We lived off a gravel road in the country and we were a good little family. Um, the factory closed. And my dad wasn't outgoing. He was very introverted, very quiet. And so he didn't get the jobs that were available. He was one of the unemployed guys. So we lived off this gravel road, and we ate food out of our garden. And that was our life. We weren't the cool people. We didn't have the clothes. And when I was in fourth grade, something heavy happened, but I don't want you to get all depressy on me, okay? Because God worked it out, all right? You see the end of the story, okay? Okay. So I got molested when I was 10 years old. And I share that because I share a history with one out of every four women and one out of every five men as reported. Mine was never reported, so what are the real numbers? Um, so I was molested when I was in fourth grade. I didn't know what to do, so in fifth grade, I finally told my best friend, not thinking, what does a fifth grade little girl do with a secret? She tells. She told everybody I got bullied. So I was looking for friends. So what was I gonna do? I know, if I'm a cheerleader, people are gonna have to be around me and I'll have friends, okay. I didn't think about the fact that, okay, look, I'm almost six feet tall. I don't look that tall in the video experience. I look like the size on the screen, right? Have you ever seen a giraffe do a cartwheel or the splits? <laughs> no, but I practiced until I learned and I made the squad. So we're at rehearsal, eighth grade, rehearsing after school. And we had this community service person around and they were painting the walls and cleaning up the school, which sounds like a great idea, except for um, I was raped when I was 13 years old. And I didn't tell anybody about that till after I was married because I had learned my lesson. Well, life had failed me to that point, and then we moved. New zip code, new school district, new people, new life, new everything. And I didn't know that boys could think that I was cute. They invited me to a party. That was my dream. I went. They wanted me to drink. Okay, I want to be at the party. I'll drink. They wanted to kiss me. I don't want you to reject me. I just want friends. I'll kiss you. And at 17 years old, life had failed me, but I failed myself, and I became a pregnant unwed mother. 
you said you wouldn't get depressy. <laughs> I'm sharing all of that with you because God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And if he can do what he has done with a girl like me from a gravel road and a past like that, what in the world can he do with you? But we can live a victim or we can change our perspective and become a victor. But to become a victor, it is going to take faith. Everybody say faith. faith. But if we're going to walk by faith, we have to know what faith is. And this scripture starts with when faith is. So they're going to put it on the side screen so you can cheat. There we go. Nope, that's not the one. So that's the one. Okay. So, let me ask you the question. It's the first word of the scripture. When is faith? Now. now. Faith is not yesterday. Faith is not tomorrow. Faith is not when I go to church. Faith is now, and now is always. Because now is right now, and now it's 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 right now. Faith is always. So, when is faith? Faith is now. That's when God wants us to walk in faith. Then what is faith? Now faith is, okay, what is it? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I read that and I thought that is poetic and it is beautiful. Now what is faith? <laughs> right? I'm like, I need more. I need context. I need depth. I need, I need an understanding. If I'm supposed to live by this thing, what is this thing? So as I decided to dive into this thing, I was like, well, why do I need faith? So I decided to look it up, and I'm about to give you a Bible quiz. Now, don't freak out. You're going to look really smart because your girl's hooking you up with the cheat sheet. The answer every time is faith. So when I do this, you say faith. Ready? We're going to practice. Ready? Go. Faith. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. So I found out that we are saved by faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8. It says we are saved by grace through Okay, we're saved by faith. Oh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says walk by faith. and not by sight. So we walk by faith. Okay. Uh, oh, Romans 1, 17 says the just shall live by faith. Live by faith, walk by faith, save by faith. I wonder how we pray. Oh, James 5, 15 says the prayer of faith. shall save the sick. So we pray by faith. Okay, we pray by faith, we live by faith, we walk by faith. Uh, but... How do we get healed? Oh, Mark 10, 52. He says, go thy way, your faith has made you whole. Oh my gosh, faith is everywhere. We walk by it, we talk by it. How do we talk by it? Mark eleven twenty three and 24. Whoever should say to the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith, your saying is important, shall come to path. He shall have whatsoever he says. We're supposed to speak by well, that's kind of mimicked in 2 Corinthians 4.13. It says, having the same spirit of faith. We believe, therefore we speak. We speak by faith. And it also says in that scripture that having the same spirit of faith. So faith is a spirit. There's a spirit of faith. And there is also 2 Timothy 1.7. Is this too much scripture? No. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, we don't have a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a strong mind. So how does fear relate to faith? Have you ever looked at a map or a compass and you've seen the little north-south line? That's like fear and faith. Fear is going one way on the line, spirit. Faith is going the other way on the line, spirit. I like to say, never let the voice of man, fear, trump the whisper of God. Faith. Faith will whisper to you, which is why it's so important that you're here, that you're in community groups, that you're listening, that you're praying, that you're together because God will whisper to you faith. The thing about faith is, now that we're knowing why we do faith and that faith is a spirit and it's substance and evidence and something about that, so we're going to dig into that in a second, but what does it mean? It means that a 17-year-old pregnant unwed mother got a desire in her heart to be married, but who's going to marry a girl like her? Well, y'all, I found this guy. It took me like five years, okay? So he is tall. He has high cheekbones. He works out. He has medical initials after his last name, and he cried when I walked down the aisle. Oh, I had the best marriage for three whole weeks. That's when it started unfolding things I did not know, that he had been on prescription medication and got addicted to it. 
and it became cocaine. And then it became crack cocaine. And then he herniated my C7, he broke my ribs, we ended up foreclosed on, bankrupt, I was basically homeless. He's still an addict today, almost 30 years later. And I thought, who's ever gonna want somebody with baggage like me? It takes faith to look again. Well, I wanna let you know I found this boy. It took me a couple years, but I found him. <laughs> and we have been married for 26 years. His name is David Crank. And he was the pastor of his dad's 180 member church. And so we were getting ready to get married. I told him everything. I told him all my baggage and he still wanted me. Mi esposo es un poquito loco. And um, so he still wanted me and I needed to talk to him about money because there's some things. And he's like, oh babe, I get you. Single mom, student loans, credit card debt, whatever it is, we can handle it. And I said, well, my conversation about money goes another way. I work really hard and I make a lot of money. He's like, girl, you rolling in like a five-year-old LeBaron, you live in an apartment. I'm like, don't be hating. <laughs> and, he, and he said, what, what, what's your story? I said, I just want you to know I'm a tither. I return 10% of my income to, that, to the house of God. And then I give offerings on top of that. He goes, okay, my dad's a pastor. He's going to love you. <laughs> and I said, well, I just want to make sure that you love me too because sometimes my tithe checks are ten and $15,000 because some months I bring home about six figures. A girl like me somehow got in a position like that. It took faith to step out and believe that God could use somebody like me to fund the kingdom. But he was. And then God asked me to step out on something I couldn't see again. Let's see if you remember the statement. But with God, it's never for less. It's always for Wow, you guys are smart. Smartest service yet. Just say it. Don't tell the other kids. So never for less, always for more. God starts telling me to quit my job. Yo, I start responding with, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> but I look back, it looks like Jesus. I'm like, why? <laughs> why? And um, I finally get the bravery to go to my husband of about three years at this point. And I said, hey, you make $474 a week. Mm-hmm. Um, I make a lot more money than that. Mm-hmm. I think the Lord is telling me to quit my job. He's like, mm-hmm, the Lord's telling me that too. I was waiting for you to come to me. So we had total life adjustment. And for four years, I went to work for the church. They had 180 people. They couldn't afford to pay me. So I worked for free for four years. And that is when my father-in-law, who was a young 56 years old, took the express train to heaven without a lot of notice. It's never for less. It's always for, it's hard to remember it in times like that. So we're like, what are we going to do? we got to try and keep this church of 180 people together. We were at a loss in the natural, but in the supernatural. God had us. We had to walk by and not by sight. So we started trying to keep it together. That was 2004. 2005, God calls us to put our church services on TV locally. In 2007, our church grew from 180 people to 2,000 people on a weekend. God can really blow your mind. Then in 2008, he said, hey, you guys are fishing and you're catching people, you're catching fish and you have no boat to put in them. I want you to build a church out in the St. Charles area on the other side of town. We went shopping. The only building we could find was $6.3 million. It changes the octave of my voice to say that. <laughs> so we don't have that money. Like if we use all the money we have, like if we have four bad weeks at the church in a row, God, we couldn't pay the mortgage. We would lose it. God didn't change his mind. We had to step out on what we could not see to get the future that we thought we could not have, that God could see in the spirit because we were looking with our eyes. So we step out on that and we, and we make the move. And in 2008, our church grew by 103%. Over 2,000 more people joined the church. We made the mortgage payment every month. We kept growing. But like ShamWow, but wait, there's more. God told us to buy another building in St. Louis. We bought 115,000 square feet. We moved there. God increased us. We finished the construction in 2013. We finished the construction in 2013. God said, I want you to take another state. Go to West Palm Beach, Florida. Start popping into a high school down there and go to the other side of Missouri and pop in there. 2014, he had us buy a building for this one. We wanted to buy a building for that one. We didn't think we could afford tickets for me and my husband to Florida. More or less, our daughter, who's gorgeous and single. I'm taking resumes. No, I'm kidding. Um, um, I'm like, how are we going to afford the tickets for just us? How are we going to do this? We have to walk by faith. 
and not by sight. So we start doing that. Then in 2019, God gives us a building down there. He gives us a chapel, gives us a whole building. A whole building, $2 million building, $1 million uh, renovation. He just gives it to us. I'm talking fast because there's a lot. In 2019, it happens with Michael Brown and all of that. Our response is buy a church in Ferguson, Florida. We buy another church up here. We got churches everywhere. How are we going to afford this? I don't know, honey. Are we crazy? No, we're just led by the Holy Spirit. Okay, now what? The Lord tells us to buy a 10-plex movie theater in Fairview Heights, Illinois. We buy it. It's under renovation. He finally unveils a building in Florida. It's under renovation right now. I'm telling you right now, faith is not a destination. Faith is a journey. You keep walking by faith and you never stop. Why? Because I want to please God. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So my, my question and my challenge to you today is, are you pleasing God? Because if you're doing just what you know you can do, if you're walking in, you're like, I got this. I got this without thinking. I'm good. I've practiced. I've rehearsed. I know what I'm doing. Good for you. Glad you're mastering your craft, but you're not walking by faith. What are you doing that's scaring you? I wrote in one of my other books, faith doesn't begin until your ability ends. It has to be completely outside of you unless you're doing something in your life that scares your pants off. So what are you doing? What are you giving? Where are you serving? What are you starting? What are you walking in? That's scaring you. I want to encourage you today. I think that's what the Lord is speaking to your heart. So to dig into what is faith a little more, I started pulling out another translation. If you're newer in the faith, you might be, why are there different translations? New King James, King James, Passion, NIV, ESV, Amplified. Like there's all these translations. Why the translations? Because the Bible wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. So people had to translate, which I never thought much about until I tried to learn Spanish. Yeah. Aprendo un poquito de español, pero mi español es muy mal. Yo soy una gringa. <laughs> sí. And when I was trying to say my husband was hot, I was at an 11,000 seat auditorium at a church in Guatemala, and I said that my husband is hot. Little did I know it meant something very different. Right? Translation. If I want to say my husband's a little cute, I can't say he's pequeño guapa. I'd be calling him like, what, girly cute? He would kick me if he could understand me. He doesn't speak Spanish. Because so, little is poco, pequeña, pequeño, poquito, poquita. There's so many words for little. So we see the word little in the Bible, and we just assume it was little. But actually, they're trying to describe a nuance of something else. So the amplified version uses more words to try and describe the word that was in the original text. Does this make sense? Okay, so go to the Amplified Translation. We're going to look at what is faith from that version. Now, faith is at the same time. They put it up there. Okay, when is faith? Faith is? Now faith is the assurance. Not substance, the assurance. I'm like, okay, I get assurance. And assurance is not insurance. Who has insurance at their job? Say me. Right? What is insurance? It's our fallback plan. It's if something bad happens. It's our just in case. Faith is not our just in case. Faith is our assurance. It's what we walk in every day, regardless of anything, right? So faith is our assurance. It's our title deed, our confirmation. So title deed. Okay, be ready to be so jealous of me, okay? I can take it. So when I was 16, I bought a car. This hot, sexy, beastly, 10-year-old Ford Escort. With falling apart seats, I bought the seat covers at Walmart. It was tan on the outside and matte. Not matte, the cool matte. Matte, the matte from it sitting outside too much. Had 110,000 miles on my little beast. And I owned it with the bank. So if I didn't make the payments, they were going to take my little tan beast away from me. So I had to make the payments, all $600. That's not a month, y'all. That was the whole car. So $600, I paid it off. And the bank released the title, and the state of Missouri sent me this little green piece of paper that said that that little tan escort was mine, and nobody could ever take it away from me. What is faith? Faith is that little green piece of paper that says, faith for your future that you can't see with your natural eyes. It is yours, and nobody can take it away from you. We grab onto it by faith. That title deed, and we hold on to it. What's it the faith of? What's it the title deed, the confirmation of? It's of things hoped for. 
Our hope is a divine guarantee. Things divinely guaranteed and the evidence, like if you're in a trial, the evidence of things you cannot see. Faith comprehends. Now, faith doesn't comprehend in your head, right? Your head can't do the math on your miracle. Your spirit comprehends, right? So faith comprehends what cannot be seen by the five physical senses. You can't see it. You can't hear it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. But the eyes of your spirit can latch onto it. Are you getting a picture of what faith is? Can I get an amen? Amen. So we have this faith to please God, but it always sounds a lot easier than it really is. Now we have to remember, right? It's never for less. It's always for. So there's this Christian comedian. His name is Tim Hawkins. You guys ever heard of him? I brought a couple pictures of him. He goes to our church, and he's always weird in pictures. Like, what are you doing here? What is this position? And she's just always funny like that. And so Tim and Heather uh, took us out to dinner in 2019, and because he's a comedian, they make great money, they took us to a steak dinner, and our answer was yes. So we were eating steak, and they're like, hey, we just want you to pray for us, pastors. We're making a decision. Um, We're coming off the road for at least a year, maybe forever, Now, Tim employs his kids, his wife, his uncle, his cousin, his brother, his family, his brother's family. They have a warehouse. They have a bus. They said, we're selling the bus. We're selling the warehouse. We don't know what the Lord's going to do, but he's just telling us to come off the road. Y'all, Tim's on the road 300 nights a year. Like 20 people depend on his income. So we're like, okay, yeah, we will pray for you. That's a commitment we will make. And me and my husband left him like, oh my gosh, are they cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? What is happening here? The Lord told them to step out on something they could not see. So uh, 2020, COVID happens. Tim and Heather want to go out to dinner. We're like, we'll pay. Meet you at McDonald's. <laughs> no, I don't remember where we ate. And so we're at dinner. They're giving us an update. They said, guys, you won't believe what God has done. They said, see, the way it works, because he sells out arenas and huge buildings everywhere. He said, the way it works is we announce a show, people buy tickets. The ticket revenue comes in, and we pay for the building. We have the building secured then, then the money comes in and we pay everybody else. They said, if we had not canceled our schedule, because in COVID there were no concerts, there were no comedy shows, there were no arenas, there were no places like that. He said, we would have taken everybody's ticket money, spent it on the venues, gotten no refunds and had nothing to pay back the people. We would have gone bankrupt and lost our reputation. God saved us. What looked like a huge financial mistake with God, it's never for less. It's always for, always for more. You might be thinking, oh man, I wish I had faith. I mean, who has faith, right? When is faith? What is faith? Why is faith? Who, who, who has faith? Oh, well, that's easy. It's in Romans 12 and three. He says, for I have given every man a measure of faith. He's given faith to you and you and you and you in the video experience and you in the online and you and you and you. He's given it to everybody. Now, if you're one of everybody, say me. Yes, that's right. You might be thinking, well, I don't have like Tim Hawkins kind of faith or like get a building kind of faith. That's you people. I don't even know how much faith I have. If I got faith, I can't even find out game and see. I don't even know what to do with it. Well, the Bible tells you how much faith you have. It says a grain of mustard seed. Great, God, the tiniest seed of all seeds awesome. Thank you. Well, don't look at your seed. Look at your harvest. Because when you plant a tiny mustard seed, you get a big old mustard tree. You have enough faith for whatever it is God has called you to, even if you can't see it until you look hard. God has given you a measure of faith. We walk by faith. We talk by faith. We live by faith. We walk by faith. And what you say is so important. Um, I was, I was talking to a pastor the other day, and the pastor was, like, laughing about stuff and going, I'm dying, I'm dying. And I'm like, I need to talk to you about this dying thing because I do corporate coaching, and I'm a real nerd. <laughs> so I'm a real nerd, okay? And so I read this stuff, and there's a biology, a psychology, and a theology to faith and also to speaking. So let me talk about the biology and the psychology of speaking for a second. There's a part of your brain called the reticulating activator. And it hears every word you say. And if you do psychological studies, they will tell you, you believe what you say about you more than you believe what other people say about you. So the words of your mouth, your brain goes, oh, 
let's go to work and make that happen. So if you say, I'm dying, your brain goes, oh, let's go to work and make that happen. That's what we're doing today. And we start developing neural pathways in jest that go against the word because the Bible says with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. You can't have long life and be satisfied if you're dying. Amen? So we have to watch what we're saying over our own life because we're releasing faith and we're programming our own brain. Biology, psychology, and theology all line up in that same space. So what do we say when we don't know what to say? Well, we mentioned it earlier, but Mark 11, 23 and 24. It says, so whosoever shall say, okay, who in the room is a whoever? Say me. You're a whoever. I got you there. So who shall ever so say unto the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart? Y'all, that doubt comes from that spirit of fear. Why can a girl from a gravel road hope to write a book that's a bestseller? Why can a girl from a gravel road who's been molested think that she could help pastor a church? Why would a girl who, who's been raped and got pregnant at 17 think that she could be on Christian television? The math doesn't work. But that's okay. I have to turn away from the spirit of fear who is shouting, never let the voice of man trump the whisper of God. I have to turn toward God's whisper and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is not me and my righteousness, but it's Christ's righteousness imputed to me. I don't get what I deserve. I get what Jesus deserves. I'm not white, but he clothed me in white because he gave me his righteousness. It's just a gift, but it's a gift that we should steward. Everybody say steward. So shall not doubt in his heart, but believe, have faith. That those things which he saith, what are we saying? Shall come to pass. You shall have whatsoever you saith. So I brought a slide with me that media is going to put up. Because um, I wrote two books on like what to say when you don't know what to say. They're both called High God Books. Like how to talk to God about the tough stuff. Because we don't know what scriptures to say when things go wrong, right? We just know we want to kill our husbands and shoot our, shoot our kids and, and like go through life. And, you know, we'll figure it out later from a cell in orange. No, 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 no. We have to know what to say. So if you scan that little QR code, there's a PDF, and there's some declarations over your life. One day is on mind, moods, and attitudes. One day is on health and healing. One day is on provision and finance. One day is on what to say and how to use your mouth, how to use your faith. And then if you get on my website, I have a free audio download, like I say a line, you say a line. I say a line, you say a line. Because we need to speak by faith. Everybody say faith. Can I tell you one more story I didn't tell in any other service? Okay, so we were going to West Palm Beach. We didn't have an office, and we went on TV in West Palm Beach. So we knew one couple in the whole area when we went down there. They had just started a business down there, and they said, hey, you want to come see our new office space? We said, sure. We were on our way down there, and our office called me and said, hey, we're going on TV this week. We have to release the show, but it has a St. Louis address on it in Florida. Don't we need a Florida address? I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys are so smart. Thank you. As soon as I leave here, I'll go to mailboxes, et cetera, get us a P.O. box. Done. They're like, okay, I'll call you in an hour. So we go up in the most premier building. If you look at the West Palm Beach skyline, there's a pink building right in the skyline. It's that. We go to the penthouse floor. We're walking around the penthouse floor, and they're showing us this gorgeous new office. And the guy turns to us and goes, you know what? Huh. I have too much office space. Like, I bit off too much. We're like, oh, no, he needs to get out of this contract. He says, why don't I give some of this office space to you guys? We're like, oh, we can't afford this right now. This is expensive. We're, just, we're new in town. And he said, no, I'm going to give it to you. He gave us the premier office space in West Palm Beach, Florida. And I'm like, your girl needs an address. What's the address? Y'all ain't going to believe this. 777 Flagler. Oh, my gosh. God is unbelievable. You got to walk by and not by sight, right? God doesn't provide, and then you step, you step, and then he provides. So we're, we're trying to figure out what to do every step of the way. And, and I get that we don't know what to do, but we can't walk around saying that we don't know what to do because there's more for us. Speaking of more, because like faith, you have to have faith to get saved, right? So if faith was the water in this cup, this is like the faith that it needs, that you need to get saved. Um, is the cup full? Is there room for more? Well, I happen to have a little more right here. Okay. So, um, let's say more. More, you've got faith to get saved. What about faith for serving? Oh, okay. 
definitely more full of faith than I was before because I didn't have time to serve, but I just bit it off and started doing it. And what do you know? I have more. Um, is the cup full? Is there room for more? Okay, well, giving and tithing, okay. I started doing that stuff, and I was really nervous. I remember making the phone call to my mom when I was a grown-up saying, Mom, I'm going to start tithing. And she's like, good, because that's according to the Bible. It's about time, sis. I'm like, okay, Mom. Because, Okay, this is really full. Ashton, will you come hold me, hold me with this? My daughter is gorgeous. Just clap for her because I love her. So my daughter is also a tither, so I start tithing and giving. And Does that look full to you guys? Yeah. <laughs> she said yes. <laughs> yes, because I'm going to get wet. Um, is there room for more? You know, it looks full, and your life might look really full too. You might have a really full life. You might be married, got kids, great job, car that you like, house that's just fine, and think, I'm good. Wow. Are you pleasing God? Because what about your life scares you because you're stepping out into something you can't see? Even when it looks full, do you believe there is room for more faith? Yeah, because I don't want to serve a God that stops. I serve a God who's exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask, think, or imagine. I serve an overflowing God. So if I serve an overflowing God, I want to give him some overflowing faith. Amen? But I'm telling you, I don't want to just know how much of God I can fit in me. I want to know how much of me I can fit in God. Because when we do that, we really overflow. And when we put ourselves in God, we disappear. And He takes over. And we can contain so much more. That's delicious. Can I give you one more story? I'll close with this. So I was on Christian television and there was this opportunity to go on secular TV. And I love you Christian people, but I am called to the people who are not saved. Right, I want to reach them. I want to tell them about Jesus. Time is short, y'all. You do not want to go to hell. It's hot. It's terrible. And you're going to spend eternity there. And there are promises of God. And when you start believing God right now, you live in those promises right now. They're yours. So I want to tell people about Jesus. And I get this opportunity, but it's going to be a lot of money. And I don't have it. So I told my husband about it, expecting him to say, yeah, babe, you're making a smart business decision. Don't do it. And instead, my husband says, pray about it. Which was kind of my way of already knowing. He already knew that I was supposed to do it, but he just wasn't going to say it. So I prayed about it, and I was still really scared. And they needed to know. And he said, what are you going to do? Are you going to walk by faith? Husbands. Well, I want to please God. And I knew deep down in here that I was supposed to. I was just walking with a spirit of. So I signed the contract and I didn't have the money. So I do some corporate coaching coaching and speaking and keynotes. And I'd been working with this one Fortune 500 company. And so the next day after signing the contract, my accounting department calls and says, hey, uh, we got a $20,000 check from this one company you've been working with. I said, oh, no, 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 don't cash it. I didn't do an event with them or anything. Don't cash the check. That's a mistake. I'll call the senior vice president and see if they want to void it, return it. So I called her and she said, that's not a mistake. She said, this is a secular organization. The Lord told me to send you $20,000. Y'all, I was shaking. I was about, I was sweating instantly. I was about in tears. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't have the provision and I took the step. But when I took the step, I had the provision because with God, it's never for less. It's always for what step is God waiting on you to take? I believe there is one. And I believe one of those steps is the prayer of salvation. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you haven't had the amount of faith yet to make the best decision of your life, can I lead you in that prayer? Or if you made that decision once upon a time and life happened and you got lost and hurt and confused and turned around, but today you wanna to let you and Jesus know, I'm putting you back first. I'm gonna hold Carrie under, would you Jesus? I'm gonna have you take the wheel and I'm gonna get in the passenger seat. If that's you today, would you raise your hand so I see who I'm praying with? Who's making this decision and rededication? I see you. 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 Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, don't miss this opportunity. So everybody, pray this out loud with me. Say, dear God, I need you to lead my life 
I sinned. So you sent Jesus to save me, heal me, and love me. You died for me, and I will serve you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.